story of Aramide Akinti Milei, who takes her time to go and lecture out of school children. We have one of the highest number of out of school children in the world, 13.5 million. Yet this young woman has decided to go out of her way to ensure that she does something about this problem. Now, we would not know the story of Aramide if Oni Sunday had not covered it. So we're joined today by the journalist behind that content, Oni Sunday, who is not just a broadcast journalist, but the founder of Hold, Hope, Hold a Hand, I beg your pardon, Hold, the Hand, Hold the Hand Foundation. Thank you yeah. for joining us, Oni. <laughs> Hello, Oye, can you Thank you, you very me? much, Olive. All right, great. All right. So let's, let's talk about, you know, th this is a very beautiful story, League of Extraordinary Nigerians and, and the work that you're doing, highlighting the stories of Nigerians who have in one way or the other made impact. People would otherwise not know, you know, if you didn't write their story or bring their story to us. Tell us how it is behind the scenes. We saw the, the finished product of this work. What was the behind the scenes like, your interaction with these children? What was the first thing that came at you the moment you met them? You know, Give us a feel of what it looks like behind the scenes. Well, clearly, um, sorry, Aramide's um, story is just one out of many stories that I have told. So when we talk about behind the scenes, it really takes a whole lot to get, get to that particular point. I remember when I started the program, there are those who said stuff like, um, you might never find up to five people to feature um, on the program. Where are you going to get extraordinary Nigerians from if you're not going to be featuring the names we know, if you're not going to be featuring money bags, mm -hmm. which is what television is awash with. So um, this is me doing something that, you know, it's not very attractive to begin with, um, telling stories of ordinary people who otherwise would rather hide and not even let the world know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So getting to that point really did take a lot. But Aramide's story came from a suggestion by someone on Instagram, because I put out a promo saying, please tell me the carpenter, the man, woman living close to you, who is making a difference, you know, in people's lives. And I jumped on it. I went on an Instagram page, found Aramide, and said, this is what I heard. I actually saw the pictures that spoke for, them, spoke for itself. And she said, yes, I'm open to an interview. And, you know, I drove down to Ota. And um, yes, that was it. It was really, I mean, it's really not easy um, seeing this young woman, you know, help this kid. When I got to the school premises, the kids were all present, most of them, before I did got to school that very day. My crew, uh, my cameraman and I got there before her. And the moment she came in with their snack and the, the carton, like you saw the, the opening shots in the report, all the kids ran to her. Like, they were really eager. Mm -hmm. Most of them already were already covered in dust before she came, because these are just children. Um, these are kids who probably, probably sold something that morning before coming to school. So, you know, it was really fun just capturing them do what they do, welcome her, the way they welcome her every day, irrespective of the camera being around. In fact, the camera wasn't even recording when we got that. And I had to send her back to say, please, I need to capture that moment. Mm -hmm. Can you just go back? you know, and come back in again. And, and, you know, the kids were so happy to hug her every time. You saw them step into class. And while she started teaching, you have the babies, like the ones in front, um, seated there. Uh, they were not going to have a class that day because I think their teacher wasn't around. Um, Ramide worked with other volunteers who helps her as well. But they were just happy to be in school every Saturday. These kids are not in school Monday to Friday. But she also opened up to me that some of the kids who are in class attend regular school. But the education is nothing to write home about. She told me the story of six-year-old who didn't understand, you know, come, like C-O-M-E, come. You know, and she said she had to do that with her hands before the boy understood. So she also told them, you know, I'm having um, classes every Saturday mm -hmm. and you can join these kids. You can also tell your friends to join. And with that, the number grew. Um, it's also not easy having these kids all settled, but she's doing a fantastic job. She brings half a bag of pure water because according to her, she says, children drink water a lot. Mm -hmm. And these kids are more than happy to have it. And after classes, she has this very little lollipop thing she shares, you know, for them. And that also serves as an incentive for them mm -hmm. to come. And while teaching, you had kids who came late. I mean, you saw the story of Rakib. Rakib is a barber. Rakib walked up to her one day and said, I don't want to be an internet fraudster. Because apparently, I think his siblings do that. And he said, I want to be, I, I want to learn. You know, I want to get educated. So she also tried to get Rocky, you know, um, to a barbing salon to learn, you know, um, and all that. And that's what he does for a living. You saw the girl who came in who sells, um, who sells a car. A car, yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's what she does before coming to school every morning. So she doesn't just wait for kids to come. Aramide actually steps out to these parents, to their houses, to convince them. She says, 
you know, sometimes she actually has to chase these parents mm -hmm. to release her kids to, 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 to her. So it, it's a whole lot. Just seeing, being that moment, I dedicate a day to each person's story, kind of like walking a mile in their shoes or half a mile in their shoes. So it was really interesting seeing her interact with these kids beyond just being um, a teacher, you know, being a family friend, being a big sister um, to them and their parents as well. Hmm. Okay, now looking at uh, that's uh, quite an exceptional uh, individual. Now let's even talk about the the process at which you get to uh, to select these stories you would always want to tell. Um, you said you, you have people reach out to you, you know, via Instagram, you know, emails and whatnot. But how do you select the story and uh, the ones you would want to tell? Are they based on uh, the urgency of the story or maybe the society um, uh, relevance of the story. How would you select your stories to go and uh, do your reports on? Well, people hardly actually send me suggestions. Aramide was the very first okay. suggestion I got via Instagram. But not until I put up a promo a few days ago that I got a couple more suggestions. Okay. So what happens is lots of people send me NGOs and I do not feature NGOs as a matter of principle. Okay. I do not feature NGOs. I'd rather tell the story of people who have a predicament but are making a difference. That's the, that's the, that's the gist okay. about League of Extraordinary Nigerians. Okay. There are people who have the money, you know, to make a difference, and I commend that. But for me, what I want to pass across is the fact that you do not have to have it all to make a difference. So there are people who reach out to me, you know, probably being funded by one organization or the other. I do not consider those people's stories to be told. Because I'm trying to say it's not just the rich in society that make a difference. And because I also noticed, why I also started, because I noticed there's this craze for everyone to get rich, one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. Legally or illegally. Yeah. Because, you know, you won't be recognized. You, you want, people also want to do the Robin Hood thing, you know, steal to enrich the poor. And in their minds, they feel they're doing something amazing. You know, so to weed all that out, I'm going after the hero who has a predicament. And that is why you see a story of a Patrick and Bamara who doesn't own a fridge or owns a school in Ajegunle where he collects plastic bottles for school fees. That's why I have a story of an Ayon Barbasi, who is an abandoned Olympian, who is the number one humanitarian in Lagos today, fixing potholes in Aja, money given to him to feed, he's fixing the roads with it. That's why you have a Madam Georgita, you know, who, who has been a traffic warden for 32 years, retired from the police force, but still working, but does not collect bribe. That's why you have the story of a Dr. B.C. in Mina, who set up a hospital for the poor in Mina, but still adopted 11 children that are not hers, and have been taking care of them from the age of three. You see, that's why you have a story of uh, Malam um, Abdullahi Abubakar, the 83-year-old imam in Jos, who saved over 200 people from different ethnic and religious backgrounds in a community without electricity, in a community without water, or, I mean, someone who stepped out to look at gunmen and say, kill me before you go into my house, kill anyone you think is in there. So these heroes all have predicaments, and that is the criteria for picking them. And I try to explain that to people to say, I'm not here to create a platform for you to push your political affiliate or any politician or anything like that. No, we want to show the predicament of the hero hmm. and get people to be the hero's hero by helping these people. You know, so basically that's about it. I get some of these stories from stories that have already been told. So these stories have been told by the BBC. They've been told by all the media organizations. Yeah. What I realize is that it just stops from telling the story, which I understand is what journalism is about. I stepped out to do what I call journalism with a soul. So not just telling a story, but how do we bring about a change in this person's life? Mm -hmm. And that informs my decision for every story I tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. You know, you, you're telling these stories, but there's a very important element as you chase the stories the emotion. How are you able to separate yourself, your emotion from the story? I'm sure that there are stories that have sucked you in, drawn you in, and at the end of the day, you'd probably go home and cry or cry in the moment or try to act strong. Have you been able to deal with your mental health whilst pursuing some of these really heart-wrenching stories? Well, it's, it's really been tough. Um, Olive, you're very right. I have cried on set a couple of times. I have had my cameraman scold me for disrupting production from my wailing, especially when I went to interview Dr. PC, who also adopted a blind kid. And now Tanko can see, because hmm. um, she also paid for his surgery um, and whatnot. It's a very poor home. His father is late, his mother sells firewood. 
you know, and it was just cataract he was born with, you know, and she saw the boy and said, you know, what's wrong with him? And the mother said, that's the way he was born. He doesn't see. And she said, give, give him to me. And already, she's already adopted his sister a couple of years before. And, you know, people looked at her and said, are you all right? I mean, it's bad enough you have this number of children and you pick up a blind kid. And she said, well, we just want to help him. Well, I'm proud to say that during the whole COVID thing, he had his second surgery and two eyes now are perfect. Wow. Thank you, he's well. Now, trust mm -hmm. me, sitting down there and I asked the kids, I said, do you want to say anything to Dr. C? I want to tear up right now because, I mean, it happens to me every time I tell the story. And Tanko in Aousa, because he couldn't go to school all that time, said, you know, mommy, I thank you. Um, he says he remembers how he would always fall every time when he's taking a walk with his friends. He says when going to buy stuff with his friend, he falls down. He says, mommy, I thank you for teaching me how to kneel and pray. Hmm. Just hearing that kid say it in Aousa, Dr. BC said it crying. I said it crying before her. I couldn't help it. It was just overwhelming you had a little girl say you took me in from the age of three so these things really got to me now i'm going to confess that i'm a very emotional person i think maybe that's part of why i got into the story and um a couple of us actually thrive you know when there's just love in your life and for me at that point in time i do confess i had a bit of that going on in my life so it was easy for me to come back and just cry you know over to someone um that is over now so clearly for me I have to draw strength from within. You know, for me, it's now a case of um, when I see the story and I open up myself emotionally, I'm human, so I just have to do what I need to do. But then when you come back, I'm not going to lie to you, Olive. I also do this for me in a way. The joy I feel every time I finish telling a story is indescribable. Hmm. I, I go to bed the happiest person. I tell people all the time, you never go wrong. You never miss it when you make a difference in a person's life. I feel honored to be in their presence. So every time I come back, there's a story to tell my mother. There's a story to tell my friends about who I met. I mean, I do not miss an opportunity to take a picture. And just lying down there and knowing that I told that story, knowing I met this person, I think it's the best reward. It's the best feeling ever. So yeah, crying to my pillow. I pray to God for the opportunity that I have. But I'm not in their shoes. I must confess, especially after leaving Joss, um, I actually didn't think I was going to leave that village alive. My mom begged me not to go. So beyond even the tears cry in the presence of these people, the risk taken as well to get into these villages to talk mm -hmm. to these people. And, you know, coming out of there, when I was going to bed and I said, thank you, Jesus, for today, it, it held a different meaning. When someone said... When someone says, oh, you have a good night rest, it took a completely different meaning till this day. Tell us about because you see, risks. Like, I think it's important yeah. that we know these risks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like going to Joss, for instance, um, in a community where you have read, but about 250 people were killed were in killed. a raid, mm -hmm. right? Where mm -hmm. 12 people, where 12 communities were raided. You find out that, now, a week before I made that trip, my stringer in Joss, I called to say, you know, um, What's going on? Are we good to go? And he said, because I'd already read a report about three military personnel who were killed on the same road who were going to fly. Now, the plan was for me to go from Kano to Joss because there are no flights from Kano to Joss. And um, I had to go by road. I talked to a couple of drivers and they said, Madam, I'm just going to tell you the truth. For us to go to Joss, we're going to have to pass the, the Joss forest or something like that. And he says it's a very treacherous road. Anything can happen. Is it like we get any signal when anything happens. Another person says another route you can follow is Bochi. Another person says another route you can follow is Southern Kaduna. Mm. Now hearing these places I've mentioned, these are hot spots. Yeah. So what happened was the only option I had was to come back to Lagos, then take a direct flight to Joss. Now this is a show I'm running without sponsorship. Mm. This is out of pocket. So that already broke my heart, but then come on, life cannot be bought to start with. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to Joss. By the time he said, okay, cool, we can do it, I had to pay a couple of, um, you know, escorts. But trust me, going through that road, I realized it was God all through. Because you see, it's, I call it an ambush haven. You are driving in between rocks. Anybody can come out from anywhere. The mm -hmm. men who killed the military personnel were hiding behind rocks and trees. They had cut down the trees before we got there. And just one single bullet went through two people. So you see, going through that road, my heart is pumping. Like anything, because they don't even have a road. 
it's a path. So you see, even if you want to escape, how far, how, how far much can, can you your go? carry yeah. you? Mm -hmm. You know, so getting to the community, another fear that also dawned on me was when they were describing the story, they said that the attack happened just about this time after evening prayers just like this. And then you are there and you hear the call to prayer. So at that moment, you're almost feeling like history is about to repeat itself. Like the Deja scene is just vu. about to be reenacted mm -hmm. for real, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just exactly what I felt at that time. And at the same time, you had to stand in the open to do a piece of camera whereby you stand and say a few words about the report. So this, every time a bike passes, because this is a community where you have everybody you can suspect. You have the Fulanese, you have the Biram, you have everybody, you know, all around. So you can never tell who is passing to give information to whatever and say, oh, we have a, jour a journalist here. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is just a village in the middle of nowhere. That was the risk. I only was able to exhale after we left the community. And that's why I say, leaving that community, they're like a sitting duck. Because when I asked the imam, I said, do you fear that, you know, the attackers will return? And, and he said, we can only pray they do not return. So you see, that gives you an idea of the kind of fear or the kind of you know, condition under which these people live and the kind of fear that went through my own mind, you know, to say, oh, you are not also safe here. I kept on telling everyone, let's shoot this and try and leave before it's dark because that road was just a no-go. But for me, I think the part that really broke me down the most, which is what I featured in my last program, is when I was taken to the spot where 250 men, women, children, babies were giving a mass burial, I almost walked past it without knowing that's where they were buried because there's nothing to remember them by. It's just sand. And the village is so poor that they really cannot put anything over it. Mm. And that's what the imam is saying, that they're hoping that with a bit of assistance, they can put up something there over the grave for people to know that this is what happened on this day. But the most important thing for me is, is um, after that, what next? This is a community that has never had electricity. There are metal poles, there are no wires anywhere in sight. There are no hospitals anywhere. Any woman would die on that road on the way to hospital in town. You see, and what pains me the most is that this particular imam has had a one-on-one -on -one with the president. Hmm. And I'm asking, what next after that? The phone call we had last week, he did mention that. So you see, it breaks my heart. And I'm saying, these are really very unfortunate situations. And that's why I keep telling people that when it comes to the power of change, the power of you lies with us. Like Aramide said, if we keep on waiting for the government, nothing will happen. Most of the assistance these people have received on my show have never come from the government. It's come from people like you and I. It's come from ordinary people making a difference. And that is the idea I want to push out there to say, do not lose your humanity, irrespective of what you think the government has taken away from you. It's unfortunate that, you know, at this point, we can only make a difference maybe 10 years at a time. But then, is that your excuse? for not doing something in someone's lives. If these people can, what's your excuse? That's, that's basically the ideology behind it. And I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned this because right now we have a high state of insecurity in Nigeria. Just mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, we had 81 people murdered, murdered in Bernu State. We have seen uh, mass attacks in the northeastern part of Nigeria. So much that is going on and we must keep talking about it. And with people like you that constantly also lend your voice to telling these stories, they become more practical, more visual. I mean, you're talking about passing a mass grave and not even knowing that there's a grave there. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. Say their names. We have George Floyd. We have these people who have been murdered and they remember their names. We don't even know their names. How can we even honor their memory? Mm -hmm. How can we ensure that this doesn't happen again? These are the questions that we will ask mm -hmm. and we will continue to ask. Yeah, and uh, looking at the, the, the exceptional stories that you've been talking about, and we're also saying that, okay, so far, um, you, you put yourself in harm's way to make sure these stories are, are, are seen and are heard. I uh, would, 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 would like you to run us through another, um, another exceptional story that you believe that, uh, would, uh, that's really necessary for people to, to, to go through and look at from one of your past reports. Is there any other exceptional story that actually had you know, life-threatening incidences in your, to, your, to your life and all that? Can, do you have other ones like that? Okay, um, I was going to say, I was going to say probably the one in Kano. I mean, okay. hey, this is Kano. Kano was the one that gave us one of the biggest scares um, with Boko Haram, when Boko Haram was at its peak, if you remember, yeah. where there was that massive bombing that also claimed the life of a, a channel's journalist. Mm -hmm. So clearly, what I also do not like to 
push that whole narrative of fear in the North. I, I grew up in the North. It was a very, very peaceful place. And I understand that most parts of the North are still very peaceful. But you can never tell yeah. what can happen. Let's, let's face it. So, yeah, going to Kano gave me a bit of that as well, especially when I was told where I was going to be going to. And um, this is a story of a lady who, she's also, she's an on-air personality, a radio presenter okay. on Correct FM. And you know what she does is she doesn't give money to the less privileged in society. She teaches them a skill. Hmm. So after her very busy schedule Monday to Friday, what she does is she goes on the internet and she finds people who are skilled, people who have transferable skills and reaches out to them to say, I can create a platform for you. Will you be willing to come teach men, women, boys and girls how to fend for themselves, how to do what you're doing. And she has really changed lives. Mm. So yeah, going to Kano and she said, from the airport, she says, oh, we're going to this community or this village. Oh, I said to myself, another road trip. Mm. Like, if I could honestly fly to everywhere, I would yeah. be more than happy with that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we did, but it wasn't so bad. But another place I'd say that really gave me a bit of a fear was Quara. So where I told the story of the core member who finished five projects in five months. Um, going to meet Samuel Omaka from the airport, it was about three, it was a three hour trip into that community. Wow. So wow. I also wasn't, you know, very relaxed because this is the road we're going by again. The road is also fantastic. So anything could happen, you know, mm -hmm. at that point um, as well. But we did, you know, um, we got there. That was the first time I ever felt like fainting. So I got to this community and it was hot. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't eaten or anything. And so the first thing I did was, can I have sugar cane? I needed to have sugar. And I thought I was going to help. Trust me, it really did not help much. Oh, the no. chief um, in Western what I mean, after, call it lunch, when we're done. But walking to a Fulani settlement, because that was the, the, the big part of my story. There was a Fulani settlement that were, they were all drinking water from the same pit their animals were drinking water from. Wow. And, you wow. know, Samuel visited that community. This is beyond the other four projects he had done. Mm -hmm. Visited that community, you know, and they were all look appealing. I mean, that, the water was practically red. And they said, this is where our babies drink from. So imagine mothers who have new babies and everything. Wow. And this guy, without spending a dime of his money, and that's where the lesson is, without spending a dime of his money, completed these projects. He started with social media. Social media is powerful. He put it out there. I was taking pictures every day of the children drinking from it, taking pictures every day of mothers drinking from it. Someone saw it and said, if you keep doing it this way, there won't be any difference. I think he said he did it for about 20 something days. And the person says, we need to tag the right people. And this guy just took it up. And they said, they're tagging the right people. And then this foundation, oh my God, I, 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 I can't remember their name now. You know, they, they, um, they, they carry out water projects in different communities. And then they saw it, sent people to verify if it was for real. Um, they came, checked, saw it. In fact, a government official got involved in the state. Mm -hmm. And she, she used these boys to train because they put her up there, commissioner for water. You know, at the end of the day, she never, ever visited the place or made any difference. And then someone far away in Kaduna saw that tweet, put it up, sent people to come check what is going on. And they came, assessed the situation, got the cost. I think it said it cost about 420000 or so to do it. And they sent these people with the equipment to come drill a borehole. If you see the video of the villagers rejoicing, just seeing clean water come from the ground, it would make you wonder, like, are we in the same country? This is so sad. These people so were sad. so happy. You know, just getting clean water come up from... And I had to go visit where they fetch this water from. So with that very high temperature, even with the sun being so hot in the evening, yeah. I almost passed out. Wow. So that was one wow. where my own health was at risk yeah. because that was a different level entirely. But just seeing them fetch that water, seeing kids pump out water. And like I said, this is a settlement. If not for Sam, that settlement will probably just be there till now, drinking red water, red water. falling yeah. ill and dying. And all it took was less than 500,000 naira to make that. a difference. Wow. So hey. Oh yeah, yeah. We, we we could talk Amazing. from today Amazing. till next year with you. You're full of you're well full of stories and experiences, and I'm 
I'm glad to be living them in this moment vicariously okay. through you. But before we let you go, it's important that we have a conversation. I'm asking this because we are women. And right now, it's not really safe for women around Nigeria. There's been conversations about gender-based violence. We've seen more reports of rape. And the federal government has come out to blame the lockdown on the increase of rape. However, we're seeing lots of perversions, rape apologists on social media. What's your take on this? What can we do? You know, and are you doing currently doing any stories on rape? Well, um, Olive, at the moment, I'm not doing stories. What I've decided to do right now about the rape issue is step out to tackle the problem at the very foundation, and that is educate. So I'm starting a campaign called Educate to Stop Rape. But you see, it doesn't matter how much you look at those stories, the lack of education is the problem. And I think that's really very shameful that anyone who says as a result of lockdown, we're seeing whatever. Mm. Thing is, it's always been there. And at the bottom of it is a lack of education. I'm sure everyone has seen those videos of the mother who was blaming her two-year-old child for being yeah. raped. Yes. That was a situation where the mother, you know, actually didn't report her new husband for raping her baby until the guy threw her out. Mm -hmm. You have a situation where men still ask questions about what was she wearing? Yes. Why did she go there? You have mothers who have a bubbly little girl and they look at her and tell her, the way you're going, you're going to get into trouble. And you end up having a girl child who grows up trying to box herself because she feels that when she expresses herself, be it through her dressing, be it yeah. through the way she walks, be it through the way she talks, she is prone to get raped. So we need to help people unlearn what we learn from our uncles and our aunties. You have men who have been taught that if you share a room with a girl and you do not make a pass at her, you will be seen as a weak man. So even if she says no, try. Mm. You have men who say, even though a girl says no, she doesn't really mean it. Try again and again and again. What most men do not realize is that when she gives in to you at the end of the day, that is rape. And I'll tell you why. Because she's scared that if you have to beg one more time, you might rape her. I had this conversation with some very so-called educated men. And at that point, he dawned on them that they have actually raped a couple of women. Hmm. Now, let's also change the conversation. My posters, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't give it to your producer on time. My posters say, boys get raped too. And that's a conversation we need to start having. Mm -hmm. And you see, most boys do not speak up because when an older woman has sex with them as children, because they've been made to believe that that's you growing into manhood, because they've been made to believe it's cool, these boys do not say anything about it. They only realize years later that they have been abused. So we can't keep sitting down and hashtagging. We can't keep sitting down and having this conversation in cocoons. We need to step out to the market. And that's where I'm starting from. I can't hit the market sit these women down and ask them, sit the men down as well. And I'm happy that we have men who are volunteering as well. Sit the men down and say, have a conversation with your boy. Ask him, has anyone touched you here? Has anyone touched you there? Did you like it? Do you realize it's wrong? Same thing with the girls. There's been too much pressure on the, on the girl child too about much. how to behave to your wife, about how to behave if you want to remain in your husband's house, about how to behave if you want to be desired. Is anyone teaching the boys about how to behave to be a good husband? About how to behave to be respected in society? We need to have everyone on the table. We're not switching the table. We want men to talk to their girls about the tricks men play to get you in dangerous positions. We want women to also teach boys about things older women can do to you that are not cool, that are gonna be termed rape. So I'm gonna be asking everyone, please, my foundation is a young foundation. I started it to just contribute money to buy sanitary towels for women in IDP camps, not even people in school, IDP camps. But this is very important because you see, it breaks my heart seeing how this happens every day. So please, if you want to join the movement, let me know. If you also do not want to join my movement, you can always start from every time you go to buy Pepe or anything, talk to the woman, talk to your taxi driver about it. Mm. You'll be surprised what people say. Somebody once said, oh, we rape women out of frustration. The economy is hard. Really? Like, it's my fault that the economy is hard. So the thing is, we need to talk to people that it is not allowed. Some people see rape as an instrument of punishment. You see a girl on your street who you feel has been rude to you, and the next thing that comes up from his mouth is, I'm going to rape that girl. Mm -hmm. Come on. True. Okay. You know, this, people come from places. So we need to. We need to attack. We need to attack this. And education. As important is, as it is for us to attack rape,
I think it's also very important for us to attack sexual abuse, Oye. And I'm saying this because not many people know what is considered sexual abuse. Not many people know that it is wrong for you to cut call a woman. It is wrong for you to try to touch her in the market. Hey, my color, my color. <laughs> and you're pulling her, you're talking at her, and then when she refuses to answer you, you make passes at her. Many people have gotten very comfortable with sexually objectifying women. Now, we, I would like you, the floor is yours. What message would you like to pass across as we wrap up? I'm going to say tapping is wrong. We call it tapping. So, Olive, from tapping, we graduated to my color. From there, we graduated to I can do what I want to do with her. These are things that started from primary school. We call it tapping current. Tapping current has to stop. It goes back to what I say. Mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, educate yourselves. You do not have a right to anybody's body. I know I'm going to sound controversial right now. Teach your boys. They do not have a right to their girlfriend's bodies. They do not have a right to their wife's bodies if she says no. If you understand that, you will understand that you have no right to a stranger's body. Mm -hmm. Look, we need to really get extreme on this. Right? When you sit down, you can have your own definitions about, oh, come on, she's my husband, she's my wife. I mean, he's my wife, my husband, she's my wife. But we need to get extreme so that you understand that if this person who I see every day has to give me permission for me to go there, how much more a stranger outside? We need to tackle it from primary school. The word is tapping current. At least that's easy for our kids to relate with. They mm. do it every day. So tell them it's wrong. Mm. That way, when they see people doing it in the market, they will attack the man to say, what you're doing is it's wrong. wrong. So at the bottom of it, again, Olive, Education, educate, educate to stop rape. Educate to stop rape. Educate to stop rape. Thank you so much, Doi. In fact, like you mentioned, Amazing. if we were to go into that conversation about spousal rape, we will not leave this set today <laughs> because that is another conversation for another day, but a, an equally important conversation. But thank you so much for the work that you do. If people would like to work with you or reach out to you, how can they do that? If you want to do it on, um, if it's going to be for the rape campaign, just send me a hashtag, hit the market. Send it to 080-2622-1778. 080-2622-1778. Or just send me a message at holdahandfoundation18 at gmail.com. Holdahandfoundation18 okay. at gmail.com. That's what I want to do. Hey, League of Extraordinary Nigerians also doesn't have... So come on, if you want to jump on that, be my hero. Mm -hmm. I need a hero as well. So please jump on that. Support us. The foundation needs the support. League of Extraordinary Nigerians needs your support as well. All so right. please, thank you. Thank you so thank much, you Oye, much. for sharing this time with us, for leading mm -hmm. us through your journey and helping us see your experiences through our own eyes. Because we felt like we were there with you. I, for a minute, I was in Kano. Another yeah, minute, so... I was you know, in another state. <laughs> you know, talking to this blind boy who just got his eyesight. Thank you for these beautiful stories. And cheers to sharing more stories in safety and in security. Yeah. To enjoy more of these our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.